Welcome to another episode of Animator Interviews. My name is Evan Vernon. I'm a contributor at Animation for Adults, as well as Animation Nights New York, or Annie for short. For those new to Annie, we are a monthly screening event and yearly festival that celebrates the very best in animation talent. Our artists come from all across the globe, and many have gone on to have their work featured at Cannes and other prominent festivals. Our next screening is scheduled for this Sunday, February 21st, and will take place on the Annie website. Attendance is free, and films will be accessible from 11 a.m. to 11 p.m. Eastern Time with virtual mixers from 3 to 5 and 8 to 10. We have three guests with us today, all of whom will be featured at Sunday's screening. I'm joined first by Chris Plimmer, a British animator who created the stop-motion short Man's Best Friend Forever. Set in a technological dystopia, the film introduces us to a world where dogs don't die. In lieu of euthanasia, owners can preserve their pets by having them mechanically reconfigured. Eternal life comes at a price, though. Dogs who undergo the procedure are given robotic bodies and limbs, retaining only their heads as they are transformed into freakish cyborgs. For owners, the procedure is a delight, but for their canine friends, it is nothing short of a living hell. Will anyone end this abuse, or will the dogs be forced to suffer forever? You'll have to watch and find out. All said, Man's Best Friend is a stirring film with lessons that will haunt you long after the credits roll. Today, Chris has agreed to talk about the short, discuss its message, and offer us some insight on his career. Chris, thanks again for being here. I'll start with a question we ask a lot of our artists. What got you into animation? So I became an animator because I think it was around eight years old where I got gifted like a pack of plasticine. And I don't know if you know this, but like um, Walsam Gromit and stuff, that's what mm-hmm. they used to do their animations with, like their puppets. And inherently from me just using that, sculpting it and just playing with it as a kid, that's what I wanted to move on to as an adult, mm-hmm. just because like, I don't know, you, you want to make money from your hobbies, really. Or you, if you enjoy your hobbies, it's kind of like you want to do that as a job. So that's what really got me interested in stop motion animation. You mentioned Wallace and Gromit. Do you think that Ardman, the, uh, the studio behind that, mm. played a formative role in shaping you as an artist? Oh, hugely, Did you have any influences? Yeah, yeah. yeah huge. You know, growing up, Wallace and Gromit was kind of like my feel-good movie. You know, the kind of movie that you would watch when you were ill or sick from, from like school or yeah. something. That's the kind of film that I would watch my sick days just to feel a bit better. Yeah, absolutely. I remember watching Chicken Run when uh, I was about six years old. And I think that was the first yeah. time that Ardman had actually made it to the States. I'm not sure if it was yeah. their first feature film. It was their uh, biggest, well, I think it was their most profitable like feature film mm-hmm. they've ever done. Yeah, but I think it was their second feature film they might have done. Okay. But yeah, it was like definitely one of their biggest. I'll defer to you on the history. (laughs) I'm not sure you're right, but yeah, but no, I I remember being really just um, kind of mesmerized by it myself too, as a kid, because Mm. stop motion was still relatively new at the time. And to see something as um, fluid and novel as that was really inspiring, you know, even from like an American perspective. Mm. So I guess that's also like the photorealism of it as well, because Mm -hmm. before that we had Toy Story and Toy Story looks great, but it's not photorealistic, is it? Like it, it's definitely got a cartoony 3D look to it whilst, Stop motion has this very, like, it's real, it's in the world, it's your toys, you could do this yourself. Like, it's almost got an era of, like, believability or, like, groundness that just kind of Mm -hmm. relates to the audience a bit. Yeah, that's that's a fascinating perspective. Um, And it kind of leads into my next question here, Chris. I I was going to ask you, and I think you may have already um, given me your reply here, but, you know, stop motion is very tedious. You have to make all the models yourselves and manipulate every single frame yourself by hand. There's so much Mm. precision that it requires. I'm preaching to the choir. I'm sure that you could describe it in much more depth than someone like myself. But what was it aesthetically that drew you to stop motion? Do you think there's something that that medium can accomplish or that that sub-medium can accomplish that you wouldn't otherwise see with, say, three-dimensional or two-dimensional animation? I think all the mediums can kind of like meet, like if you put enough effort into one of them, you can get 
as good of a quality as other ones. It's mm -hmm. like uh, 3D films now, you can get them to look like stop motion and even experts can't really tell the difference. And stop mm -hmm. motion, if you put in the absolute effort, no one can tell the difference if it was like 3D or stop motion. Like if you look at Leica films with Missing Link, it's so close to 3D where it's kind of like no one can really tell mm -hmm. if it is that or not. So like they even mix like 3D next to stop motion like a hell of a lot. And it's just yeah. like there's a certain level of right now where it's just like you can achieve a lot with all these different types of mediums. But I think where stop motion kind of comes forward is where, well, not really forward, like it's not better than the rest, but it's just me personally, I like to have something in my hands whilst I'm like right. thinking of how to do something. Like uh, I've got a puppet right here. Oh, it's just yeah. something about holding it where you can think about how you're going to shoot it with your camera. Like having it, everything in place, you set, and it's just kind of moving stuff around and it's being able to add stuff in as you're going along. Yeah. And it just feels just right. It's almost like shooting in live action, but not. But it's, yeah. I, re I really like it just for that methodical level of just looking through the camera, like when everything's just physically in front of you and just working out what you need to do. Yeah. Yeah. It's so easy as the spectator, you know, again, looking from, you know, the outside in to, to take animation for granted because you've seen the final product, but you rarely consider the process. Mm. And, and what I'm hearing, Chris, is that for you as the artist, there's something very intimate about manipulating the molds yourselves and designing them yeah. yourselves. Do you think that makes the storytelling just feel more, more, I guess, involved, more close to your heart when you're making these films? I think it depends on the materials. If there's a material which you can definitely see, like uh, let's say it's plasticine on the face and you can see all the fingerprints moving and stuff. Yeah. That is definitely where you can see the craftsmanship and like you may only think it for like a split second, but you kind of recognize that as like that's hard work. Or let's right. say uh, you recognize a character that's got felt skin or it's all made out of wool or hair. And you just kind of recognize that it is like, yes, someone has made this, someone has put in all that effort and it just kind of resonated a bit. That's some fascinating insight. And I really appreciate you sharing that with us, Chris. I'd like to go ahead and talk a bit about the film. So this is, this is a really poignant story. It's only two minutes long, but says mm. far more in the span of two minutes than many films say in an hour. So I'd like to just kind of ask Chris, um, where did this story come from? What inspired this short? This uh, shot came from the fact that I wanted to make an emotional film. I know that sounds a bit dumb, but um, my third year film, because I did two student films, my third year film mm -hmm. was about people swapping their faces and it was just a one minute 15 story from point A to point B. There's no emotions. And it was just generally just through the motions. And my feedback mm -hmm. through that was you need to put more emotion into this. You need to kind of like get more resonation. Res mm -hmm. resonation sorry about that. Uh, with the audience. So um, what I had to do was effectively come up with a story that had emotional impact. So that's what I did. And it didn't really come together for a long time. And it was going to be about seven minutes long originally. It was going to have all these different scenes with the dog kind of struggling, kind of really hitting home that this dog struggles. And then I ended up just chopping it all apart and going with the beginning and end rather than the five minute long middle because it kind of just like, it didn't need it at all. Yeah, that's interesting that it was originally far longer because not knowing that and watching the film, I, I still feel like, you know, mm. the, the, the message is very clear, right? Well, I had to build everything in yeah. a month or two and then animate it with a month or two as well. So yeah. it was kind of like time restrictions really did not allow what I wanted. I thought I could get the seven minutes done. And then looking back at it, I suddenly realized like, no, like, this is not doable. I need to chop it all down. But that may have been a blessing in disguise. I mean, you, you could mm. disagree. I haven't seen the other five minutes, but um, sometimes concision is better. No, Again, I absolutely was, agree. Yeah. I was going to ask you, you know, the, the storytelling is so intimate, um, Chris, and maybe I'm being presumptive, but I feel like when artists tell stuff that has this kind of emotional impact, they're usually attached in some capacity to the story itself. Mm. You have a dog at some point who, if you don't mind me asking, maybe suffered in some way and you were trying to convey that story through this animation or was this purely invented? Um, originally it was just purely invented, but as I was shooting, my um, pet cat became blind. So it did kind of get some impact from that where 
it was kind of like seeing an animal struggle to live and it was kind of like coming up with I don't I didn't really think about it at the time but thinking about it now it does kind of like hammer home a bit that I was thinking about that little cat compared to this plasticine dog yeah the film seems to deal very heavily with this idea of attachment and mm. um, a very possessive and selfish sort of love. It's, it's clear yeah. that the, um, the, the owner that you focus on in this story loves his dog and is just kind of blind to the fact, at least until the end, that by prolonging his pet's life, he is being selfish. The dog seems to, you know, kind of want mm. to be let go and be at peace with himself. Do, do you, not to put words in your mouth, but do you think that you were trying to convey a message in that vein? Um, oh, yeah, absolutely. Like it, it was very much of this is cruel. This is like, mm -hmm. I understand there are certain levels of, I want my pet animal to live longer. Like let's say your cat's got an injured leg or your dog has an injured leg. Like that's fair enough because that's um, not really going to impact them much. But if you get into the point of where you're inflicting pain onto your animal to just extend its life for you personally, like it's a bit shady to say the least, like it is a bit like selfish and it isn't in their best interest, is it? Yeah. And that's, that really leaves the viewer with something to think about, right? At what point do you, you cross that threshold? At what point are you preserving life? And at what point are you prolonging suffering? You feel like the answer would be cut and dry. We may not have. Well, we're, we do exactly the same with like human beings. Like yeah. we've got pacemakers, but what happens when that person's dying in hospital and their heart keeps restarting over and over and they end up mm -hmm. in a permanent, well, not permanent, but like a, let's say two week long limbo of being on the edge of death, but not being able to pass. Like it's that kind of situation. A absolutely. And ultimately we're just kind of left to, to, to ask ourselves, is this humane? I, I'd like to yeah, exactly. Like, yeah. um, yeah, definitely. Like, uh, quite often, I think, I think there's a saying where people, um, say where you like, you wouldn't let your pet suffer it when at hospitals and stuff like yeah, prolonging life and, I know that that's getting a bit yeah. towards risque, like euthanasia, but yeah. Yeah. No. <laughs> and, and you don't have to talk about that if you don't feel comfortable, Chris, but I do believe that the message of this film is multidimensional. It can be applied to a variety of contexts. Mm. It's not so narrow that it's just a story about a pet. There's a very human element to it. Right. And that's what makes art so interesting because yeah. you can examine it from multiple angles. I, I love the film. If, if, you know, oh, I, you. I might say so myself. I, I thought it was very powerful and very moving and really hope that uh, people who experience it continue to follow you and see what else you produce. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> I, I did want to ask you, Chris, you, you've already started developing a bit of a catalog for yourself, but you're a very young artist. Where do you see yourself in the future? 10, 20 years from now, ideally, okay. where would you like to end up in the industry? Uh when I was at uni, I had this kind of like unrealistic expectation that I was going to be like directing like feature films. However, I know that now to be a bit too high, like too high, a bit too lofty expectations. So honestly, I'd, I'd be happy making short films or I'd be happy working on like a kid series, making animation or designing some kind of character for a show or something like that. Like, I just want to work in the industry. That's all my goals are right now where it's kind of like just keeping it low enough where it's reasonable and not aiming too high. Do, do you think that apart from doing the physical animation, you'd be interested in set building or um, you oh, know, anything? Absolutely. Like my main passion is either puppet building or directing or writing a story. Me personally, I hate animating. For, for me, that it's not rewarding enough to spend eight hours a day or even 12 hours a day just to get seven seconds of animation done. Like it's mm -hmm. just too grueling. And it's just too repetitive. But maybe being part of a studio or um, mm, a team absolutely. environment where you can collaborate and uh, contribute to um, the production pipeline in, in a different capacity would, would be yeah. rewarding. That's kind of what I'm hearing. No, it's just agreeing with you. Like, that's absolutely what I want to be, like, just part of the pipeline where it's just having some kind of involvement in the process, but maybe not animating just because I don't enjoy it anymore. Yeah. I think I speak for everyone when I say that your work matters. You have an incredible voice as an artist, and we really look forward to seeing what you do, be it in storyboarding or, or set design or puppet design, or maybe even mm. animation if you change your mind. But um, 
Uh, I think there's a bright future ahead of, ahead of you here, Chris. I've got two, two questions left for you here. You talked about continuing to make short films. Uh, do you have yeah. any other projects in development right now? Yeah, I have um, this quite weird short film that I'm making right now. Like I've got the other puppet next to me where it's like um, this. Oh, yeah. And this will be like a needle felt character head with real clothing with mm -hmm. um, a little miniature cactus. And the whole story is going to be around this um, old couple who um, I think the husband dies and becomes reincarnated as a cactus. And it's this kind of turmoil of them kind of like coming to terms of, well, how are we a married couple when you're a cactus? Interesting. It, it's weird. Like it's not going to be that long. Like I think it's going to be about four minutes long, no dialogue. And it is just kind of like, it's not going to be like, um, you know, with Man's Best Friend, where it kind of shows the before and after. This mm -hmm. one's just going to be, yes. um, starts off at the funeral, he's died, and then somehow he gets reincarnated. And then it's just kind of coming to terms. And once she realizes that she still loves him, that's when it ends. Because it's just kind of like, yeah, I want to have a bit sweet ending where it's just like, yeah, they're in love. Instead yeah. of having to kill a dog. Well, that sounds very interesting, and uh, we look forward to seeing it when it's released. It sounds like um, body horror might be kind of like a, an overarching uh, trope in your work. I'm not sure if you'd agree with that or not, Chris. But, well, it's just um, animation. Like, if you're going to yeah. animate something, you might as well make it interesting and go a bit out there. Yeah. Like, otherwise, I might as well do live action. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. And I, I think that, that that shows kind of the um, the dynamic power of animation as an artistic medium, right? That being said, not every animator takes those sort of risks. You don't always see shape-shifting take place in, in these different narratives. And uh, I think that says a lot about your creativity, too, that uh, you're willing to kind of explore these like different possibilities that mm. may or may not become reality in some sort of you know distant future. Like the idea of a cybernetic dog, who knows? I, I thought you were going to go down the route of being reincarnated as a cactus then, and I was about to say something. <laughs> Yeah, um, I won't. I won't go that far. But yeah, it sounds really interesting, Chris. So oh, thank, thank you, you for giving us a, a little sneak peek there. For everybody listening in, we hope you enjoyed this interview. Uh, if you'd like to uh, experience uh, Chris's work, be sure to attend Annie's uh, virtual screening this Sunday. His film will be available from 11 a.m. to 11 p.m. Eastern Time. We'll include all the pertinent links in the uh, interview description, um, as well as Chris's social media handles. If you'd like to follow him on a regular basis, Chris. Thank you so much for joining us today. Any last comments you'd like to make before we wrap up? Yeah, just keep making stuff, I guess. Enough like, said. Yeah, uh, practice makes perfect. Just keep making. If you want to make something, just make it and hope it comes out well. And if it doesn't, try again. Well said. Keep creating things. And we hope that you keep creating things too, Chris. Really appreciate, uh, appreciate your time. All the best to you in the future. If you're still tuning in, thank you so much for listening. We hope you liked our chat with Chris and will join us in celebrating his work. We're going to shift gears now and focus on something more child-friendly. Julie Rimbaville and Nicolas Leverin are with me now. Their animated short, Small Spark, is a playful film about a mouse who just wants to read. When the candle illuminating his book goes out, he must go on a perilous quest to find a match scaling kitchen walls and confronting hungry house cats along the way. Whimsical and imaginative, Small Spark is perfect for families and accounts for just one of Julie and Nicolas' many tales. The French duo have become somewhat of a powerhouse through the years, authoring several books and creating over 30 animated shorts in their time together. Today, they've agreed to chat about Small Spark and tell us a bit about their partnership. Julie, Nicolas, Thanks for being here. We want to discuss the film, but before we dive in, give us a little history. How did you two meet, and how did you end up directing films together? Uh, we met with Nicolas uh, 20 years ago in high school. And after high school, he studied arts, applied arts in an art school. And I studied uh, literature Literal. and cinema. And so the, the place to make something together was animation. Mm. So we began to 
to make some shots uh, stop in stop motion mm -hmm. first, with puppet first, then mm -hmm. in stop motion, then in cutouts, and then after we made 2D animation. Mm -hmm. And um, while he was, uh, while Nicola studied arts, he began to publish some uh, books for children, and illustrated. Some comics. And some comics. So uh, we, we made adaptations of the films in books or the books in films. And the first, uh, the first films that, that were uh, produced, normally pu produced, was a comic from Nicola called Croac. And it was, uh, it was short uh, episodes in one page. And we made films in three, three, minutes. three minutes. Now that's amazing. It's really interesting to see two artists collaborate to create something special. Why did you decide to focus on children's entertainment specifically? Uh, we don't decide to, uh, to write to children. We make some stories for everyone, and when it's for everyone, it's for children too. Thanks for sharing, Nicola. Appreciate that. Julie, did you want to um, add anything to that? Uh, no, it's what he said. We mm -hmm. we never really think to children when we write a story, so mm -hmm. that's why maybe there is uh, many levels of comprehension mm -hmm. of the story or of the world because. As a child, you have one level of, uh, of uh, understanding of the, the world. And when you grow, grow up, you understand more things. And so yeah. um, we like to have two levels in the films. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes the best stories have that intergenerational appeal. And it's probably not fair now that I think about it to um, box something in. I'm 26 and I like the film. So, um, <laughs> yeah. So th thank you for sharing that, uh, Julie and uh, Nicola. I'd like to go ahead and talk about Small Spark. Tell us a little bit about the story for this short. Very cute. Where did this idea come from? How was the um, the story conceived? Uh, so we we made many 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 shorts since mm -hmm. twenty years, and because uh, we have an an association, and uh, we uh, how do you say alternate. Is it the same word in English? Yeah. We made something with, uh, with the association with no budget and films with uh, a producer and some finances and uh, TV channel and mm -hmm. things normal. But we make many, between all those uh, big projects, we make uh, short projects that we can do together. Mm -hmm. And uh, Small Spark is one of these. And with this association, we organize uh, the things that we name Kino. Do you mm -hmm. know Kino? Like a 48 hour project. You have 48 hours to make a film in live action. And mm -hmm. for us, as, as we organize it with uh, many directors of animation, we say no, no 48 hours, but one week. Yeah. Because <laughs> we need time. Yeah, and uh, so small park, small spark uh, was made during a kino, and um, this kino uh, was uh, taking place in my great grandmother's house in west of France, and so she, there is nobody living here for now, but there, there are still the furnitures and her books. She was a uh, big writer, reader, mm -hmm. and. Uh, and so the idea came from, from this place and to, to look to this place in another point of view. And, et puis, et la maison, elle est restée dans les années 50. The, the house is staying in the 50s, 50s, 60s. It's a, it's a background. Just take a picture and it's a background. Yes, it's, it's, it, the, the house is like a, a perfect background. <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's really interesting that you chose to pair those animated characters with the, um, the background, the live action photographs. It felt very immersive, like the characters had stepped out of a storybook almost and entered the real world. That, that really made the, just the viewing experience, I think, very magical. So, um, yeah, thank you so much, Julie and Nicola, for sharing that. 
animated shorts um, can entertain us. They can also teach us. Do you feel like the story, this this mouse, you know, looking for a match had uh, some sort of lesson or, or theme to it? I think uh, maybe the message is make your life be like an epic story. Adventurous, right? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah, absolutely. And that's um, what, what stories allow us to do is go on adventures. And I, I kind of felt that putting myself in the, in the, you know, the mouse's shoes that I was also going on that adventure. I've just got a couple more questions for you too. Small Spark is going to be screening this weekend. Uh, you have a big catalog of films behind you already. Are you working on any other films right now? Yes, we are working on a new project and a longer project, the 45 Minutes film. And it will be a musical with songs and uh, dance. And it's, uh, it's a kind of uh, modern Christmas tale that takes place in the suburbs. Uh, in France, in France, suburbs, French, yeah. French suburbs, it's where, where, where workers are, are living. <laughs> and so it's an old Santa who is very tired. And uh, he will meet uh, a no. pizza delivery boy, and uh, they will become friends. And uh, Santa is going to try the delivery boy scooter, and mm. he broke his leg. So the young man is going to bring the gift all over in the city. That sounds very exciting. No, I look, look forward to seeing that. Um, do you anticipate screening that in the United States, possibly, or, or just in France when you're finished? Uh, this is for, for a French TV channel. Mm -hmm. In first time? In first time, mm -hmm. but after uh, it will be on uh, cinemas in France when they will be open because they are, they are closed yeah. since like yeah. 100 days. <laughs> and it's very long. And uh, the project is... Uh... Uh, all arrive very fast. We write the project when well, there's one year. Um, we don't think about the commercialization of the page. Right? Yes, and, and uh, we, we did not uh, uh, yet <laughs> <laughs> uh, thought about uh, other countries. But because it's, we have it's, to do. <laughs> it's a very... Uh, we are very a very lucky. spoken film. <laughs> mm -hmm. there, are, there are many dialogues and the songs are in French. So for the moment, it's, it's a French project, but maybe. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I'd imagine dubbing might be a little difficult, especially if you're taking music. But who knows, you know, even if a film is very culturally specific, if the story's um, compelling enough, it can find a global audience. Um, so I really hope that we do get a chance to see it. So Julie, Nicola, I want to thank you so much for your time. I've got one last question I'd like to, to mm -hmm. ask you. You're industry veterans. You've made a lot of films already. So I'd like to ask you, just thinking, thinking further down the road, what would you like your legacy to be as artists? How would you like to be remembered as storytellers? This is a funny question because yeah. uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> we never think to the posterity and uh, we consider us not really like artists, but like artisans. We are making stories now for, for the people now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we never, never think to posterity, but maybe uh, what we want to do is uh, to offer a kind of other point of view, funny point of view uh, on life. Mm -hmm. And uh, because the reality is sometimes uh, not very funny, yeah. So if, if we just try to offer another point of view on this reality, so we are happy. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, we, we need laughter. We need, uh, we need good feelings now more than anything, right? Especially with COVID going on, there's so much negativity and darkness in the world. So having stories that lift your spirit up like Small Spark is, is something that the world needs. So um, Julie and Nicola, thank you so much for your time today. For all those listening in, if you'd like to see Small Spark, it's going to be available during Annie's virtual screening this Sunday, February 21st. It's going to be available from 11 a.m. to 11 p.m. Please don't miss out. If you'd like to follow Nicola and Julie, we'll include all their relevant websites and social media handles in the interview description. Once again, Julie Nicola, 
Really appreciate you taking the time today to talk with us. Anything else you'd like to say before we uh, wrap up? Thanks for that. Thanks a lot too. Thank you.